Hey, Joe Zorzer here with Dr. Malone. Uh, we have we shoot all kinds of videos on our YouTube channel talking about personal injury, medical malpractice, various medical topics that may be relevant to our community like COVID. Uh, by the way, we've both been tested recently and we um, both tested negative, so that's why we're standing sort of close together. Um, but I thought it would be a good idea since we have a full-time medical doctor on staff, Dr. Malone, as, as you all know if you've watched any of our videos. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to a, a large uh, sampling of our clients, most of which are involved in car wreck or car accidents, to have Dr. Malone and myself go through the medical and legal aspects of the typical car wreck case that comes in, uh, so that maybe if you're out there and you've been in a wreck and you sort of want to know what all is involved in this process, this is going to be a three-part series. The, each part is going to be about 10 minutes, and it's going to cover the different sections of the case from beginning to end. And again, this is a hypothetical case. I can't guarantee that this is going to happen, all this stuff is going to happen in your particular case. But given that most injuries are pretty similar from these wrecks, um, we can sort of classify them, generally speaking, from a medical and legal standpoint. So we thought it'd be a good idea to try to run through a hypothetical situation. Um, we're going to use actual documents from a couple of different cases so that it brings authenticity to what we're talking about. And it will allow you as the person maybe consuming this information that's going through this to actually see the same documents that you see in your case. So um, the first weeks, weeks to a month of a car wreck case involves uh, the intake process in the emergency room. So not necessarily in that order. Uh, the emergency room uh, is what pretty much everybody goes through, the emergency room process. And Dr. Malone has told me this in years past, and I'll have him comment on this, but what I tell people probably five or six times a day some days is, look, the emergency room is not, not there to diagnose your injury. They are there to rule out that you're going to die in 48, in 24 or 48 hours or lose a limb or some sense. So, and doctor, you were the first person to tell me this uh, three or four years ago when I said to you, you know, everybody's pretty, you know, everybody's told me my whole career, I've gone, I've gone to the ER and they said, I have whiplash or they said, I have neck and back strain. And then you reframed it for me and you brought it home for me and said to me, you know, Look, the ER doctor is not there to really diagnose a disc injury. Yeah. In, unless it's that bad of a disc injury. Yeah, it has to be a, a disc injury so bad that you're going to lose your limbs, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Potentially, or be paralyzed. Mm -hmm. So most of the cases that, that we see, now we do see paralysis cases, but most of the cases we see are not paralysis cases. They're disc injury cases, but you're not going to get that diagnosis yet. The diagnosis you're going to get in the ER is... The contusion, uh, low back pain, muscle spasms of the head and neck, motor vehicle. Sometimes they reference the motor vehicle accident. Most every time they reference the motor vehicle accident. Um, and now the ER, though, is not going to have the benefit most of the time of the pictures from the accident, seeing how the accident happened. They do ask their doctor whether airbags deployed. Why is that relevant to yeah. the doctor? So the whether or not the airbags went off tells them, did you by chance strike a hard object, the steering wheel, windshield, the side window, um, if there's not a curtain airbag. So that tells them one thing to look for there, but also if the airbag went off, there may also be some some trauma from the airbag, like right. soft tissue trauma in like your face or like the side of your ear. If the airbag goes off and a curtain one, you get a rupture in your drum, things like that. So they'll ask you about airbag deployment where you were in the car, whether or not you were restrained, right. and um, you know what, what the other people in the car, what their condition was. Right, and so typically, you know, the rec report that you will not get at the scene, but the rec report will look, will have a diagram on it. Now you will not get the rec report at the scene. What you'll get at the scene is called a driver's exchange of information form. And most of the clients that call me, call me before they've gotten the report. They have the driver's exchange of information form. But later, usually within 24 or 48 hours, there will be a rec report. And in the rec report, it will say who got the ticket and it will have a diagram of the, of the, of the accident scene. Here's a diagram that I think we're going to put on the board back behind me. But basically it shows a T-bone-like accident 
where the cars hit each other and um, and there's a side impact. And then pictures look that look sort of like this, where you have, you know, you don't know whether the car is totaled or not, but I can tell you just looking at these, it is. But you leave the scene knowing that you can't drive it and that it looks messed up and that sometimes the airbags have deployed. Uh, what you don't know is as soon as the airbags deploy, the cost of getting that car back in shape is probably going to be more than it costs to, fi to fix it or it's going to be told. Um, so this is the same situation. You get to the ER and more times than not, you're going to leave the ER with a diagnosis like this. Low back pain, muscle spasms of head and or neck, motor vehicle accident. Now we're pulling this from a case, just so you know, eventually that where the person is going to need surgery. So it's important for you to understand this sounds innocuous. And most clients that call me say to me, Doc, I went to the ER. I don't think I really need a lawyer because, you know, the wreck was pretty severe. The airbags went off. It was, it totaled my car. It felt bad. You know, the, the, the injury was, it felt bad at the scene because it was a T-bone accident. But, you know, the ER doctor just said it had whiplash and back strength. And they, they say to me, and by, by the way, ER doctors are so used to dealing with like bad situations, really bad situations. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. That that if you don't have a critical problem, they are not enamored, if you will, and they shouldn't be, to be honest with you, with your situation. We want them concentrating on the critical patients. We don't want them concentrating on patients that have an injury that can and should be treated by a doctor down the road. Yeah. And so you'll leave the ER. Again, as Joe mentioned, these are documents. I've distilled it to three pages, but it'll likely be like a stack of papers. And there'll be discharge instructions for each one of those. And I think we're gonna I think we're gonna put a link to these below the video so that you can access these documents. Sure. Uh, I know you probably can't see them on the camera from this far, yeah. but we'll put a link to them at the bottom of the video. But he, Dr. Mullen, has gone through medical records of actual clients and these are discharge instructions from actual clients, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. From local a local Pensacola hospital. Yeah. Every hospital. Yeah. And this is for motor vehicle collision. So you get a piece of paper that looks like this. And then this one's for back pain. What's that? Cerebral so strain. Which is neck pain, right? Yep. They call it whiplash sometimes too at yeah. the ER. And this is what your discharge instructions are going to look like. So you're going to have these discharge instructions. You should follow these. And, but you're going to get the impression, well, they didn't put me in the hospital, doctor, yeah. so it must not be a serious injury. Now, why is that logic not exactly well sound? All these instructions refer to some sort of follow-up care, and it doesn't mean follow-up at the ER unless, of course, you meet certain conditions. Things get worse. A lot worse. Yeah, things evolve. Your signs or symptoms get worse. But it's meant to be a bridge to get back to your primary care provider, to get back in the system and say, hey, like, you can go see your doctor, and at that point, do you need more testing? Because there's still something lingering there. I'm not back to normal. I don't need to be sitting in an ER in, in line with people who are having heart attacks and right. strokes. Again, the ER doctor is looking for critical injuries. He's got people potentially in the waiting room that are that are that have heart uh, chest pains, and maybe having a heart attack on the spot. So the idea that you have a, a significant, potentially a significant disc injury, is important, but it is not critical unless it is causing you paralysis or what do they call it? Par the par paresthesia. So like paresthesia, where you're numbness or tingling, and and you may lose your limbs, uh, and that's when they, it's a, an emergent kind of MRI is necessary. Um, so the next steps in the process usually are that the client is then. Uh, it usually calls us. And that's typically where I'm talking to them. They've left the ER. They feel like they're, they're, they're not going to be critical. The ER doctor has made them feel better about their situation because they got released and it didn't sound like they were going to go in the hospital. And people, people leave the ER think, and they don't go in the hospital. They think that maybe they're well. Yeah. But, they're, but in large, a lot of the times you're not. And what I tell people is if the car's totaled and you're not 15, which means you're not elastic, uh, you're probably going to have an injury that's not going to go away for a little bit. So, and the older you are, the more likely that's the case. So, 
What we have to do, and what we did in this hypothetical situation, and you'll see these records as we go through this, this person went to the ER, they had a pretty significant wreck with airbag deployment, the doctor released them with these discharge instructions we talked about, they didn't sound alarm, they called us and they said, I don't even know if I need a lawyer, but we got them to uh, find a doctor that would treat them after a car wreck, because a lot of doctors don't, um, they don't like to get messed with car wreck cases, but when you find a doctor that can treat you, you get there, and then ultimately they're going to put you in an MRI machine at some point. While you're going through the treatment process, which we're going to get to in a, in a different part of this, there is a job for us to do as your lawyer. So this is where the legal part comes in. We want to make sure that all the evidence is preserved, number one, because if there's any argument, like we talked about, this was an intersection collision where... Sometimes it's a he said, she said about who's at fault. And if somebody's saying that you ran the red light and they're saying that, uh, uh, or you're saying they ran the red light, we have to get an investigation done, which means we got to find the people that were maybe on this corner here or in another car at this intersection, vehicle number four possibly, and we need to talk to them and get their statement. I want to record their statement, and I'll, and I'll have my private investigator record their statement. So we get all the evidence collected, because the insurance company is doing that too. And then we let the insurance companies know that we're involved, so they don't bug you, and or try to get you to say something in a recorded interview that messes up your case later. So these things uh, are what we're doing in the background while you're going and getting the necessary treatment. We're doing all the groundwork, if you will, to make sure we're ready so that when you start getting your diagnosis from the treating doctors that are looking to see what exactly happened to you in the wreck, that we're going to talk about in part two, we're ready to go. So to summarize part one, the first weeks to month of your, of your, uh, after your car wreck, you're dealing with the emergency room. You're dealing with what it means to be diagnosed with cervical strain, back pain, whiplash, those kind of ambiguous diagnoses. And you're, you're dealing with how to balance the insurance companies that are probably bugging you at this point and what to do about future treatment to figure out whether or not you even have a case. Most people call me and they're like, I don't even think I have a case, but I was my car was totaled and I, 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 I'm having symptoms. Well, guess what? You, you very well may have a case. And the hypothetical person we're going through had that similar reaction and ultimately needed surgery. So... Um, was there anything else in part one we need to talk about? Okay. Uh, no, and, and just to, to dovetail into the ER, it's also getting in to see your primary care doctor, getting in the system, because that may be another step toward getting the management you need, whether it's uh, pain management or surgical options. Again, primary care doctors don't do that, but they can get you to the right providers and, and help support and say, yeah, this is a true symptom this person is experiencing. Right. Okay. So I hope you will join us in part two. Um, we're we're going to have that immediately following this. We're going to shoot all three of these today so that we're able to get um, all the whole series, make it available on the channel. If you have any questions about the first part of this of, of, the, of the case and you want to talk to us about it, uh, you can find us on the web at zarzalaw.com or you can call us at 855-HIRE-J. Thank you.